this is uh, kind of different for me because my wife is not here. And usually I have her there, and she's kind of like my thermometer. So this doesn't need to go on Facebook because she, she gets aggravated when I talk about her. But uh, I won't throw her under the bus today because she's not here. What's the point? So uh, pray for her uh, this morning. Her and her sisters left for Florida, and it's the first time that they're going down. Normally, they go down in the fall to clean the house for her mom and dad. Her mom, obviously, is not there, and this is their first time going down with with dad to go through the things and clean, and so it's going to be an emotional. It's not a very fun trip for her. Uh, She'll be coming home Thursday, so pray for her, if you would. For the message this morning, if you guys uh, were here last week, we had a ton of balloons in here and we had a good time. Everybody had a good time last week? Yeah, no balloons today, sorry. But, uh, well, there is one stuck in the ceiling fan in the back. Yeah. Kids Church. Sorry, guys, you're dismissed. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Kids, you are dismissed for Kids Church. Uh, If you were here last week, Sunday, we had quite a commotion going on, but uh, we, as greeters and ushers and select people, we, we just kind of handpicked uh, to dig a little deeper, do a little extra, make you feel better or make you feel more loved. How many actually felt more loved last Sunday than they do this morning? <laughs> don't, don't do that. Uh, but the series that we're doing right now, we started for February, is Better Lovers, and I, I explained that earlier. And it's not this sappy romance. It's nothing like that. It's strictly how can we as believers, as Jesus followers, as disciples, as Christians, what does it look like to be better at loving our neighbors and better at loving people? Last week, our message was loving those who hurt us, and we, we kind of solidified the idea that we as a human race really aren't doing that great. It's just, uh, <clears throat> you can look around. I'm not one to watch much of the news, but if you look around at, at what's going on in the world today, the anxiety, the depression, uh, different things like that that are going on, the hatred, the racism, things that are being spoken over the news, things that are being spoken on social media. It's an outlet that just becomes this, this thing that I don't, care to take part of. And what we discussed why these things are happening, and Jesus actually said it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, he said it like this, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. The love of most. Now, I would expect, and I don't expect that anyone that's in this building at Light in the Valley at this congregation here this morning would any time fall under the category of most. But if a group this size, I will tell you that we will get tested daily. We will get tested weekly. We will get tested in our lives sometime of falling in the category of most. We've not always been saved. Not None of us have always been saved. And so what does it look like when love grows cold? What's the solution? Well, some would say better politicians. We got to get to the voting booths. We got to put better people in office. And to that, I say, amen. I think that's a good start. But better politicians are not going to change our hearts. We talked about this last week. When we know that the bottom line of what's going on in the world today is a heart issue. If all of the world, imagine this, if all of the world, everybody in it, would do what's best for the person next to them, all of these other things would go away. The hatred, the bigotry, the racism, the divisions that's going on. Anybody agree with that? Amen? So we have a lot to do. Jesus says that we need to become disciples. That is his command to us, to become disciples. And then disciples go out and make other disciples. And a disciple is simply someone who studies what Jesus does, a student of Jesus, and they practice the things that their leader does. And if we're followers of Jesus, then we need to love better, become better lovers. One of Jesus' main commands was in John chapter 15, verse 17, where he said, this is my command, to love each other. It's not complicated. It's not. 
We figured that out last week. It's not complicated. A simple balloon and a pack of Smarties made your day. Right? It's not complicated. Just loving on people, becoming more intentional to love on people. My prayer every single morning is that God would send the right person to me that I could love them better, that I could make an impact in their lives. And it's incredible. If you pray that in the morning, it's incredible what your mind will do for you and what God will bring into your life. And sometimes I feel like I would have missed those opportunities had I not prayed it in the morning. But all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of a conversation with someone. I'm like, ah, that this must be the person that God sent today. And sometimes it ends up being five or six. But that's what I love to do, is make a difference in people's lives. And I challenge you guys to do that. It's not complicated. Love each other. What does that love look like? It's simply this, doing best for the person, the other person. Romans chapter 13, verse 10, he says it like this. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Love is, only, is, is committed to do only what is good and what is best for the other people. And I say it again. Can you imagine a Starting with our families. What if we did this at home, Damon? Loved each other and did only what was best for the other person. What would that look like at our house? What would it look like in your house? And what would that look like in your schools? What would it look like at your job? What would it look like in this church? And how much positive traction could we get in changing the world? 240 people here this morning to go after that if people were committed to do no wrong to each other. Jesus said last week, we touched on it, loving someone that loves you, there's no credit to that. But loving someone that has hurt you, that's where the rubber meets the road. Last week, we discussed the three steps of, of how to love those people who have hurt us. The first one is to refuse to retaliate, choose to forgive, and then set up boundaries. So I got up this morning at 2 a.m. My wife wanted me to take her to Sugar Creek to get with her sister and, and get in the car to go to Florida. And I was like, well, you know what? I might as well just come to the church. And uh, had a busy, busy, busy day yesterday at the store. Uh, it was Valentine's Day, and all the men were trying to impress their ladies. And uh, so... We had this discussion earlier in the week, and, the very, and, and someone said, I couldn't imagine taking my wife furniture shopping for, for Valentine's Day. The very first people in the door said, we've been married for 46 years, and I'm taking her out for Valentine's Day to buy a dining room set. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, yeah, we just had that discussion. But it was, it was on yesterday. It, it really was. It, was. it was a busy day. And uh, on my way out through here this morning at about Oh, it was probably, by the time we got to Sugar Creek, it was probably a little after three. I was like, you know what? A lot of times, uh, I will drive out and just circle around the back parking lot and come back. And a lot of times on Sunday mornings, I don't know. It's just something I do. It's a habit. And Becky told me, she goes, honey, don't you go to church without getting your truck washed. And so I try to respect that. And I was like, well... It's kind of bizarre to go through the truck, the car wash out there at 3.30 in the morning, so I'll just wait. I'll just wait until about 6, 6.30, so I'm not an oddball. And uh, about 6.40, I get a phone call. I hadn't made it out there yet, but I get a phone call from the Holmes County Sheriff. He said, are you the owner of Shrox Heritage Furniture? And I said, yeah. I figured Damon's in the ditch somewhere. I mean, that's the first thing that comes in my mind. What did my kids do now? And... Uh, what would you think? And uh, he said, well, I, I, I hate to inform you, but someone broke into your store this morning. I'm like, what? Why a furniture store? I mean, of all things. And so they, they nailed another store in town. And, and so anyway, he said, I need you to come out right away. I said, well, how bad is it? And he said, I, I don't know. I'm not there. I'm just a dispatcher. So just get over there. But when you get there, make sure you say your name and like address the officer that's there. I said, okay. So I get out there and I drive around the back. Sure enough, there's a deputy back there. And the back door just smashed the glass. They took a block and threw it through my glass. Glass everywhere. And I'm like, well, okay. So they got in. 
I get in my office, the computers are flipped over, the drawers are out, the files are everywhere, there's papers everywhere, the refrigerator's open. They took three cash boxes and took a pry bar and pried them open. There's pennies and quarters. I have the biggest mess to go to this afternoon that you've ever seen in your life. It's unbelievable. So I was like, well, surely they just stayed down here. No. Went upstairs. The whole sales area is just in an uproar. I mean, a total uproar. And I literally probably have more cash on me here I better not show you guys <laughs> than I had in the store. And it's like, and then I went and talked to the other uh, individual. The, it was Saul's place. So I went up and talked to Travis and them. And I'm like, you know what? This is just bizarre. And uh, yeah, they, they literally ruined my store this morning. Um, had them on camera at 437. So had I went out and got my truck washed and made a little spin through there, it might have deep. But here's the deal. There were two, two deputies there. They were like, you know, we need to, don't touch anything. You know, we're going to fingerprint. Oh, yeah, we, we, whatever. You're not going to catch these people. He said, oh, we might. We can run it against the data bank we have. You know, we might. And uh, I said, well, you know, the money is not the issue. The money is not the issue. There's an underlying problem. He goes, I know. And he said, I'm glad you look at it that way. Could I love that guy? Because obviously me and him, he's hurt me. <laughs> and I, it, what if he walked in here right now and said, hey, I'm sorry, Jimmy, it was me. What would I do? So that's what I was dealing with in the middle of trying to get my message together this morning. Okay, so bear with me. I'm a little, a little, a little uptight. Um, uh, don't boo at me or like, like jump at me because it, it might get crazy. But this morning, <clears throat> I'm tested with what the points that I brought out last Sunday's message. Refuse to retaliate. Choose to forgive. Right? And then, guess what? We'll probably set up boundaries. They're probably, we're going to put up more cameras or do something because, I mean, this is not the first time that they've been, the bakery got hit last time, and it, it, they just kind of go randomly through town. So uh, it's one of those deals. I got to choose to love those people. And, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's literally not about the money because they didn't get that much money, but it, it's, it's the thought. It's a violation of my privacy, and it's a violation, and it's the ruining of my store, I mean, the heat's wide open. I don't have any glass in the door, so we got to go out and tape some. And they wouldn't let us do anything this morning, so got to go out and tape plastic over the door. And so you'll see me jet out of here soon after church. But I got to forgive that guy. Doesn't matter if I know who it is or not, right? Would you agree? Oh, <laughs> maybe I have an option. Today, we're dealing with a different group of people, not people who hurt us, but people that disagree with us. And I see this inside of churches over and over and over again. And I trust and I'm, I'm very, very thankful that it's not a part of our people here. I, I, I truly, I'm truly serious when I say that, but I've seen it over the years. I grew up in a church with a lot of disagreements inside of each other. We've all experienced it in our lifetime. What do we do with people who disagree with us? Can we love those people? Can we love them better? Or is it just too difficult? Because believe me, they're everywhere. They are everywhere. Do, do you have them in your life? And as I say this, there's people that's come into your mind that you don't agree with. How do we deal with them? The ones that we don't understand. These are the enemies that Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. Do good to those who curse you. The ones that are wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. No, I'm right, you're wrong. Maybe that's husband and wife. Listen close, this might be in your house. I don't know. But it's the people that we disagree with. We all have plenty of these people in our lives. The debates are incredible. 
Social media gives us a platform today like we've never had before. How many would agree you can spout off and be a keyboard warrior about any subject that you want and no one can get back to you physically so you feel sort of bulletproof. You feel sort of like you can just talk about politics, talk about the, the wall, talk about uh, whatever you want to talk about, whatever subject matter that you want to talk about, you can pipe in at any time. It's never been easier to express your opinion than it is today. And we see it over and over and over. And I, I marvel sometimes at the things that I see people talking about. Maybe it's the Second Amendment. Maybe it's border security. I don't know what, what's on your mind. And I don't know what bothers you. But it's endless. The debates are endless. And where there's people, there's always going to be this issue. There's always going to be this thing of, I, I, don't, I don't agree with you. I meet with certain pastors every now and then. We, and guess what? We don't always agree with each other. But I can tell you, I've never left one of those meetings thinking, man, I don't like that guy. We've got to agree to disagree on some of the things that we disagree about. Amen? You guys are kind of quiet this morning. Is my mic on? Amen. Yeah, man, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. On top of all these debates that we're having and the issues that are out there, we have then pressure from our families and we have pressure from our groups that we're in. We have pressure from our friends and we have pressure from our work that which way are you going on this? Are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? How many know what I am? I don't ever talk about it because it's irrelevant. At the end of the day, it's all going to shake out, I believe, the way that God wants it to be. Are you a conservative? Are you a liberal? And oh, how could you be that? Or oh, how could you do this? And where do you stand on this? And we have these pressures from our families. Of, how do you believe in this? Well, I don't believe it this way. I have been in, uh, in at holiday get-togethers where it's, <laughs> uh, the debates start. And I'm like, I don't want to get into that. I believe the way that I believe, and I, I believe that God speaks to me, and I guarantee you he speaks to me differently than he does you. I would hope he does, because he is my father, along with your father, but in your personality and inside of your behavior patterns and inside of the way that you were raised, you will probably think differently than me. And it's okay. But then these groups start to come together and they start coming against each other. And it's an, always a hamster wheel of debate. I made a vow a long time ago and I tell all my, uh, the salesmen that work for me, I would like, listen, there's, there's one thing. You can talk about your family. You can talk about anything that you want on the sales floor to make a connection with someone. There's two things that you can't say. You can't debate religion, and you can't debate politics. Because when you get on one of those trails, you'll lose the sale. You, you have the capability of losing a sale because you don't know if, what they are when they walk in. You don't know if they're Methodist, Catholic, Mennonite, Amish. Oh, you probably could tell the Amish, I guess. And you don't know who they're voting for. So guess what? Don't talk about it. And if it's that critical in the sales world or out in the retail space, then how critical is it here that we don't infringe on each other? I think it's good to challenge each other. Scripture also says that iron sharpens iron. We know that. But I don't think that we should lose friendships and get heated over the disagreements that we have, and especially inside of a church. How much more sacred is it in here than it is at my store or wherever you're working? Don't want to lose sales. Well, I don't want to lose friendships. And so I choose not to talk too much about that stuff. First of all, I don't know that much about it. And, and so I would just look kind of ignorant if I started to talk about some of those things. But why is it so hard to love people that we disagree with? Why is that? It's hard. It's hard. I remember back in my childhood, my dad and I didn't see eye to eye, and it was, it was hard to love him. And I bet it was hard for him to love me. 
we used to get into some pretty heated debates, and I wish I'd have known the things that I know now about loving people, even in the midst of a disagreement. One thing that I do know, and if you look back, if I look back over my life, I know this, that these debates and these things that I have gotten into arguments about or disagreements about, they usually follow a pattern. So I'm going to tell you the pattern that I think they follow. It might be different for you guys, but I look back at some of the things that happened in my life, the major disagreements and arguments that I've had, they usually follow a pattern. And there's five steps to utter destruction in a relationship. There's five of them. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. The phase one, phase one is just simply the disagreement. It's a disagreement. You don't agree. That's how it starts. Well, I think it should be this way. I think it should be this way. Guess what? I think the blinds should be up. Well, I think they should be down. Uh, I think the music should be louder. I wish you'd turn it down. I'm cold up here. Well, I'm hot back there. That's not at my house. That's here. That's here. Those are disagreements. And if, we, and if, if you don't nip it in the bud at that, it then will go on down and it will become blame. The music is too loud because the sound man does it. That sound man needs to learn to turn that music down. The blinds are down. The torches aren't on because Ivan didn't turn them on. They are on this morning. Thank you, Ivan. Appreciate it, brother. But it would be Ivan's fault if they weren't. See what happens? You have a disagreement, and then all of a sudden, somebody gets the blame. And when you start blaming each other, that starts hurting you, and then other things ensue. Start saying, you're the problem. You're the reason that the church is cold. You're the reason that the music's too loud. You're the reason that our country is in an uproar. You're the reason that our families don't get along. You see all of those blames that start. First of all, there's a disagreement, and then there's blame, and the blame game starts back and forth. I've heard it in churches. It's people like you that we have the convictions that we have. It's people like you that we don't have the values that we should. You're the reason that we're in this position. Never heard that one at home. There's a certain steps here that we need to avoid as Christians. There's certain steps that we need to avoid as believers. And we start to blame people for problems. So you have a disagreement. Then you start to blame. And when that happens, something else really starts happening fast. This one happens really quick on the heels of blame. You start labeling people. You're an idiot. Am I alone here? You are so stupid. Anybody heard those words? See, now you're already in the third tier. Yeah, you're in the third tier of what happens in five phases. And we'll get to the other two here in a minute. And all of a sudden, you start hearing racial slurs and you start hearing slander. We devalue people and it brings them down to less than human. All because we've had a disagreement, we started to blame, and now we need to protect ourselves. And so we lash out at you, and we start calling you names. And those names are usually something that's less than human. Now, phase number four is contempt. This is just simply the explanation of why it's so hard to love someone we disagree with. What is contempt? That means... I don't like that the music's loud. It's your fault, sound man, that it's on. You're an idiot, and our church would be better without you here. That's contempt. Am I right in explaining that, Mr. Attorney? The world would be a better place if you weren't here. I wish I'd have never seen you before. Or, uh, before. I wish I'm never going to spend any more time with you because you're the problem. Do you see what's happening here? The wheel gets bigger. The, the feelings get harder. The things are getting out of control at this point because we have a disagreement. We started blaming each other. We're calling each other names and we're wishing that you weren't even here. That's contempt. 
It's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Now we're angry. Things are getting out of control. All of us can go back into a situation where these things, these four steps already have happened. And that leads us to phase number five, is mistreating. Now I won't just say those things. Mark, are you big boy? Can I keep picking on you? Now I'm going to go out and I'll just take my key and run it through his car. Peel the paint off and go to the other side. Don't laugh. I did that. Not to Mark. I did that. I was a revengeful, evil, revengeful guy. Then you start mistreating. If you look, you can, you, you can go back to Adolf Hitler. Same thing. Think about what he did. Think about the sequence of events that he did in, in Nazi Germany. Following me? They disagreed on something. All of a sudden, they started blaming the Jews. Right? Then they started labeling. They had to put the patches on their arm. They actually, then the contempt started. You know what? You can't shop here. You can't get your groceries here. We're going to segregate you. We, we made divisions. And they ran ads on TV. They started uh, using the analogy, like basically calling the Jews rats. They would, they would use that analogy in a comparison. And they made all of Germany turn on the Jews. And then guess what? They started mistreating them. And then it turned into gas chambers, and it turned into firing squads. You guys know the story. Millions of people lost their lives because of a disagreement that got out of control. It wasn't stopped. And I see it happen in families, maybe not to that extent, but I've seen it happen in churches, maybe not to that extent. But you guys get the picture. If you don't stop in the first two, three st stages of a disagreement, it will ultimately, someone can get hurt. Mistreatment. How many of you, when you were watching the Ohio State and Clemson game, started blaming the refs? Oh, come on. Don't, be, don't, don't do it now. And did you call the refs any names? <laughs> yeah. And you said something about that would be mistreatment to their wives, maybe. I don't know what you said. I've been in the stands. I was invited to go to a Cleveland Browns game, and uh, the refs were the fault of everything. To the guy behind me, I, I laughed so hard. because Every time the ref blew his whistle, oh, you, know, you would just go off. And I'm like, it, 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 he's supposed to blow the whistle. And if they'd have lost that night, which they didn't, the, St the Steelers lost. Um, if they'd have lost that night, it would have been the ref's fault. And they would have, those refs get escorted to their cars because it's a disagreement. There's blame, there's contempt, and there's mistreatment involved. You're not above it, and I'm not above it. I've done it. I'm here to confess it as sin. I, I'm, it, it's, it's a sin to live that way. To not love someone because you have a disagreement. It all starts with that, and we can't let it go. And we blame, and we label, and we are in contempt, and try to get rid of that person. And if we don't, we start mistreating. How do I stop that downward spiral? I'm going to give you three ideas. How do we love those people better? How do we become better lovers of the people that we disagree with? And I think the very first thing that comes to my mind is we need to know their human value. We need to realize and we need to be sure, sure that they have human value. And how do we do that? People have value because of who they are, not what they believe. Do you agree with that? People have value because of who they are, not because of what they believe. People have value because they exist, not because their ideas don't align with yours. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 is this. And I've noticed over and over in Scripture, when God puts a word, when God puts a word inside of a verse about two or three times, then you need to start paying attention to the what he's trying to say. What is the word that is threaded through there three times? Created. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He did what? Who did? And then I have, I'll never forget, and I think I've said this before, uh, I actually uh, used this, and it's not original to me. It was an original, I guess, from a guy here. He told me one day, and I used it when there was a couple that was not seeing eye to eye. And he said, I don't understand why my wife does the things she does. I just don't get it. I'm like, well, welcome to earth. Like, none of us do. So, but here's the deal. <laughs> I, I, to, I took him over to the window, and I said, look out there, the grass. Do you believe that God created that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, there were birds flying. You believe that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It wasn't wintertime because it's, it's not easy to believe anything right now. But, uh, <laughs> and I, I went through some of the different things that you could actually ju see just simply by looking out of the window. And I said, do you believe that he created me? And he goes, yeah. I said, he did that on the sixth day, right? He goes, yeah. I said, and he said after each one of those, what did he say? Well, he didn't say it. He saw that it was good. And then he stood there. Can you imagine what was going through God's mind? As he said, you know what? I need a partner for that man. And we have this saying in the English language that we save the, I can't hear you, the best for last. How many would agree that the woman is the best? It's Valentine's weekend. Come on, guys. Y'all can play along. Thank you, Mel. So, so he was like, why would you argue with what God has created the best? He waited to, to create woman last. Yeah, she comes from us. Rib from our side, we get all that, we believe that. But why would we argue with something that God created and it was his best creation? I say that to say this, why would we argue with each other if we're God's creation of that and we are good? In his eyes, it was good. We don't have the right. We have the right to disagree. but We don't have the right to mistreat each other. We can become better lovers by not mistreating each other due to something of a disagreement. I would love to hand the mic around and hear stories of some of the most simple disagreements that you've been involved in that ended up escalating out of control. Ever been there? I have. And I look back and say, man, if I would have just done some things Different. If I could have just in the moment stopped and said, you know what, I, I realize that God created you and what I'm doing is not just against you, but it's against God. It would have saved me a lot of heartache. He said that in two to three times in one verse that he created. He's the artist. And we have great value because of who our artist is. I went to the relief bus last year, and it, it hit me there already, like, wow. These, these people live such a unique lifestyle compared to what I have and what I, how I live. And you would think, wow, can, can, does, can we really love them? And yeah, they're God's creation. The kid that broke into my store this morning is God's creation. God bless him. He didn't get much. He'd have got more by asking. I think it's important that we keep understanding 
that all of us here and all of us in the world are God's creation. Knowing that, I can be a pastor. It helps me to be a pastor. Because I, hey, where there's people, there's problems, and we hear about some stuff. Yeah. And I'll never forget the night or the day that I was ordained and, and commissioned as associate pastor. I had uh, two of my sisters came up from Florida, and we were standing back there in the back, and everybody came through receiving line, basically. And my one sister, my oldest one, the wisest one, I guess, huh? She'll watch this and agree. She gave me a big hug, and then she held me out, and she goes, you know what? You can be the best communicator in the world, Jimmy, but you will fail as a pastor if you don't love your people. And so that evening, we were sitting in my living room, and I, I asked her, I said, what do you mean by that? And we had an all-out little Bible study right there in my living room the first night that I was uh, uh, commissioned as a pastor here. And, and it was like, I understand. I'm not always going to agree with everything that, that you guys do or say, but I also know that you won't always agree with me either. And if we can, if we can agree to disagree, no one gets hurt. Am I making sense? Good. So how do I start? Loving those who disagree with me. Number one, understanding their immeasurable value. They are value. God created them. Number two is be humble. Be humble. We must be humble if we want to love those who disagree with us better. I have been through this. In Philippians, Paul says it like this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should in be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. I'm going to read it again. Instead of being motivated by self-ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Not, not because they agree with you, but simply because they're human beings. Can you imagine if everybody you ran into this next week, you would put into that category as more important than you? What if you treated everyone like you would if, if, an, if a famous person came around? What if you walked into the bank on Tuesday morning, because tomorrow's President's Day, they're going to be closed. But if you walked in on Tuesday morning and you treated those tellers like they're more important than you. What about when you order your coffee over at Ginger House or Wall House, wherever you're going to get it? What if you treated those people like they're more important than you? What if you did it at, on your job? What if you did it at school? What if you did it at home? Imagine that, the downward spiral of blame and contempt and mistreatment would end. How do you treat those people who are clearly more important than you? How do you treat them? Do you treat them differently than you do me? I mean, I know I'm the most important one in my house, so... It's not fair to ask Damon. Y'all get what I'm saying? It shouldn't be that way. Those that have more influence than I do. Those that have more money than I do. Those that aren't able to do things or are able to do things the other way around more than I can. What if they're more athletic than I am? Jesse, what would you do if I was more athletic than you? Would you treat me better? <laughs> I love you, man. He laughs. Just this week, we were invited to go to a, uh, a private lunch with Dr. Caroline Leaf. Anybody know who she is? Dr. Caroline Leaf is a, is a very famous author, and she was a neurosurgeon in her earlier years, and she is the smartest person in the room, I promise. I promise you. I mean, Becky talked about it, like, with the message and everything. Like, we treated her like royalty. 
I mean, I would have never burped after my lunch in front of her. Maybe I would in front of you. No, I'm kidding. But, I, you know, everything was prim and proper and yes, ma'am. And it was, and, and, and the other thing that I did that I caught myself doing that you guys will not believe, I listened. <laughs> I, I sat there and listened to her. I was scared to talk. I know, it doesn't even make sense, does it? Why? What if I treated each and every one of you that way? What if I want to take a selfie with all of you this morning? <laughs> ah, keep that thought. Not going to happen. But Becky wanted a picture with her, you know, and she was like, well, I don't mind if you take a selfie, you know, and I'm like, oh, no. And Becky was like, no, 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 I want a good picture. Like, so I had to take like 10 of them. Has she done that with you guys lately? <laughs> there I threw under the bus. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry, hon. He's just saying, Paul is saying, to treat people like they're more important than you. It's amazing how our demeanor changes depending who walks in the room. And if we had that honor and we had that respect for each other, it would be a different world. I was on my best behavior Thursday. You guys wouldn't have even known me. Talk less and I listen more. When, that's tr when, when that is the case, it's, it's easy, right? It's easy to do when, there's, when you know that just the status that they're, that they're more important than you. But what if, what if we did it with everybody? We wouldn't talk over anyone at the lunch table today. Y'all are going to be scared to have lunch today, I know. That downward spiral would end. So we would understand human value. And we would be aware of it. We would be intentional with it. And then we would have humility. These are the ways that we start to better love those who disagree with us. And then number three is give respect, which is possible because of the first two. Brennan, if you want to bring your team up. Huge amounts of respect because we're humble and because we understand that God created these people. That's how life should look with those that disagree with us. Because of who they are, not what they believe. Because they were created in God's image. Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 10, it says like this. Love one another with brotherly affection. And everybody say the next word, outdo. Say it together. What does outdo mean? It means it's almost like a competition, which I'm competitive, so I like that word. If you're going to treat me this way, then I'm gonna, I am going to treat you this way, and it's going to be better. And back and forth, back and forth. Can you imagine how our marriages would get better if you say, hey, honey, I'm going to wash your car today. Well, if just for that, I'm going to rub your back. I'd stop there. <laughs> Outdo one another in showing honor. When's the last time that we collectively as a church have outdone someone in honor? When's the last time you did it individually? You know what? I know that you did this for me, so I'm going to do this. And it's going to be bigger and better than what you did for me. Showing honor and showing respect. I'm going to take it up a notch because you showed it to me. Our marriages would be off the charts if we did that. Outdoing our spouse with honor and respect. Because disrespect and dishonor, the opposite of that, will ruin and will take a marriage out. So how do, how do we turn and, and know how to break the spiral of disagreement, the blame, the contempt, the labeling, and then the mistreatment? We give loads of respect to people based on their value through our humility.
It's that simple. You take those three steps and you combine them together and you live your life intentionally that way. And guess what? Jesus set an awesome example for us in that very sequence. The way we've lived, the way we were born, it was in disagreement of what, it, what he would have said. And guess what? He didn't wait till we changed. He didn't wait till we had a change of heart to go to the cross. No. He did it and gave us the option to change. If you wait around, if you have a disagreement and you wait around, for those people to change their mind and come onto your group and think the way you do, you are putting, you're closing the door on love to them. Think about it. You're closing that door. You're not allowing it to happen. We're reading, uh, you guys can stand. We're reading together a Rick Warren book right now uh, as a leadership. All the leaders, the elders, and the, and the pastors are reading this book together. And then we have a book, like a, a little study at the end of it. And Rick Warren says it this way. Respect guards against mistreatment. You don't want to mistreat anyone, then don't. But here's what you got to do. You got to show humility and you got to show loads of respect. And he says it like this. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or you must hate them. The second is that to love someone means that you agree with everything they believe or do. And both of those are nonsense. He goes on to say, you don't have to compromise your convictions to be compassionate. How do we do it? Recognize value. Know who the artist is. We respect that artist's creation. And we show respect through humility. We become better lovers. I'll leave you with a question and then we're going to close. Who do you struggle to love because you disagree with them? It can stop. You can be a better lover.